<laughs> and speaking of the rhetoric, I want to conclude on one that I've been hearing a lot ever since this book came out, um, Debating Same Sex Marriage with Maggie Gallagher. How many of you have heard of Maggie Gallagher before? Okay, Maggie Gallagher is not many of you. Founder of the National Organization for Marriage, which is fighting uh, against marriage equality across the country and pouring all kinds of money, millions of dollars in the states like Washington and Maryland right now to Minnesota to fight our right to marry. Um, and so a lot of people have said to me, you know what, even by engaging people on that other side, by having public debates, by doing a book, you are legitimizing their views. And we shouldn't legitimize their views, we shouldn't debate things. I want you to understand something about the word bigot and what it does. When I call somebody a bigot, I am not simply saying that they're wrong, I disagree. I'm saying that they don't even belong as part of the conversation. It's a conversation stone. And the problem with this is that it's stuck in the conversation at a time where half the country is still yet not on board. This idea that we shouldn't even dignify the stuff with a response. And so what's the alternative? The alternative is that we don't actually respond to it. And I think we see way too much of this now, where instead of talking to each other, we talk about each other, we label each other, we demonize each other. And to be clear, it's not just one side that's guilty of that. In fact, for many years, most of it came from the other side. Anytime the other side would label people like me as deviants, as perverts, even as sinners, Satan's agent, all that kind of stuff, it was a way of suggesting this person does not deserve to be taken seriously. We marginalize them, we put them outside of the conversation. And I think that that is a mistake at this point, at least in most cases I think it's a mistake. Partly because I think that our fellow human beings just deserve respect even when they're wrong. And partly because I think we want to make progress on the issue and we're not willing to do that unless we actually engage the conversation. When I asked about Maggie Gallagher a few minutes and moments ago, so two of you raised your hand and recognized her. Those of you who do recognize her, I think you have a certain image in your mind. And I, and I guess that the image of Maggie Gallagher that you usually see on pro-gay or pro-equality websites. Because usually what they'll do is they'll take a screenshot of her, and it's the most unflattering picture possible. Here's a good example. <laughs> 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 if you Google, if you do a Google image search, more of the images will come up like this than the normal looking image. Um, now, let me say to somebody who does a lot of public media work, it's not hard to get an unflattering picture of someone in a screenshot from a video. In fact, in some ways, it's harder to get a decent picture of someone. I know when I travel to schools and there are photographers taking pictures of me while I'm speaking, you know, half the time it looks like I'm doing something I've seen with my mouth. Live action shots are just not, not usually flattering for most people. And I actually know what it is making out. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time working with her uh, over the years. This picture is really a little bit hard to see. Um, but when I show this picture to people, and this is after we did an event once in New York, when I show this picture to people, they're often surprised. She looks human. She looks like she could be like the barefoot contemplative sister or something. <laughs> <laughs> the glowing cross in the background is a bonus, right? That's just <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that I saw my partner saying this picture first. Um, look, Maggie Gallagher is, for many of us, very similar to our relatives, our neighbors, our fellow church folks. I mean, she holds views that a lot of people we know and love hold. And so we shouldn't be too quick to just label that as outside the realm of polite conversation. And there's a reason to do this that goes beyond securing our legal rights. And it goes beyond just basic respect and decency for people like me. It has to do with the people who come after us. And this is something that's kept me going for, for many years working in this debate, which sometimes can be exhausting and sometimes can be thankless. About half the country is still not on board with marriage equality. And just think about those people. Think of kids, sometimes a lot of kids. And those kids, some of them, 
grow up to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. And during their childhood, during a vulnerable time of their lives, they hear the rhetoric. They hear people saying misinformed and sometimes nasty things about who we are. They hear people reducing our lives and relationships to this. They hear even well-meaning people who can't speak the word gay and send this message that there's something unspeakable about our lives. And I think about all of the kids like that who grow up in those environments, and that may be true of many of you here in this room. And I think, what can I do for them? Well, I can try to reach them directly, right? I can put videos up on YouTube, I can support the It Fix Better project, things like that. All of that's wonderful. But the other thing I can do is to try to educate their parents. Mm -hmm. And here's the interesting part. That is really hard to do after you call their parents a ticket and told them they do not belong as part of the conversation. So I want to conclude with a plea to all of you to keep the conversation going. Do it for the sake of securing equality for ourselves, yes. But also, and most importantly, do it for the sake of those who come after us. Thank you very much.